الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا عبد القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين غضب الله عنهم ورجسه وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج اما بعد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج Our series of discussions have gone into its ninth night The nights of mercy are slowly coming to an end now The nights of destiny The nights of liqa Tonight is the night where we are going to commemorate Abu al-Fadl al-Bahs. It's very difficult on this night to be sitting right opposite the Dari of al-Bahs. These are those nights now. Nights of reawakening the heart. But within Islam we get a number of nights that changes the course of our destiny. Many a time throughout the year, we fall into a routine in such a way that days go by and life goes by, not realizing the true essence. <coughs> and the essence is that one day we will meet our Creator. <coughs> These days slowly turn away and before long you know that you only have a couple of hours to live. In the last couple of nights, we've looked at the revival of the heart. The movement of the heart, which is exceptionally important, especially within Akhir Zama. Looking at some of those traditions of Amir al-Mu'mani, honestly, sometimes it feels like that he's talking to you, the way that things open up. He puts things into perspective, that life is truly short. Dying without awakening is something that 99% of the world may do. But as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we need to wake up to that reality. There's no point spending all of your life or your mundane duties and not realizing true reality, not opening your heart up. Wretched is the eye, said Ali Qadi says, that wakes up in the morning and doesn't do the ziyar of the Imam. We've discussed a lot about Qadi, the idea that the heart needs to be awoken. Otherwise you're lost. You could be sitting here. Rahmat of Allah means he brings you here, but it doesn't mean that you can utilize it. Only those people who can, who truly know the reality of their tears, truly the heart which is open. Allah's true names, Rahman and Rahim. Rahmaniyat of Allah is for all of creation. It's what brings you here, right? You're invited to come here. But to eat from the table of wilaya requires you to have another eye which is open. And that eye is the eye of the heart. When that opens up, then truly you understand what it means. Manzal al Hussein, the hadith says that person who does ziyarah of Sayyid al Shuhada, it's as if he's done ziyarah of Allah about the arsh of Allah. We have this reality and it wakes us up that throughout the year you fall away from it but there's a magnetic pull which brings you back again. Fourth Imam alayhi salam says very beautifully, he says even those people who go away, right, your children for example, which all of us worry about living in the society that we do, Azar Hussein is something that will always bring you back again. Balances you, brings you back to that. You know many of our youth in the last 10 days or so, you've noticed that there's been revolutions in their heart. Sayyid al-Shuhada's movement, as we've said from day one, is not just a movement against oppression. It's not how we compare him to other freedom fighters. That's not Hussein, we're belittling the message of Hussein. If Hussein wanted to just do that, he would have done it. There wouldn't be any oppression until the Day of Judgment. Hussein's purpose wasn't that. Sayyid al-Shuhada's purpose in Qalab comes from Qalb. Qalb means to ro rotate the hearts. The whole purpose of Hussein is to revive the hearts. That 1400 years later, when you say Labbaik Ya Hussein, it's like an energy that flows through your heart. That's the change. That is the change that we're looking for. 
So here Amir al-Mu'mineen begins to talk about Akhir zaman which we're going through, which we're going through. It's beautiful the way that he does it. Akhir zaman what is the biggest responsibility of Marja'iyat? The biggest responsibility of Marja'iyat within Akhir zaman is to keep the unity of the Shia. Where do we see this? Look into the Quran, Ta'wil of the Quran. There are numerous verses of the Quran that talks about Sahib al-Zaman alayhi salam. The problem is that we can't see it. The first surah comes forward like this. Surah Isra, which is otherwise known as Bani Israel. That surah, according to most of our scholars, the ta'wil of that surah is the state of the Shia within Akhir al-Zaman. Look at the entire surah, you'll see it. It speaks to you because it gives us meaning as to how our lives are going to pan out. It talks about Akhir al-Zaman. The entire surah does 111 verses. If you were truly were to look inside of them, you'll see each one of those verses deals with themes which are taking place in this day and age. Look, if we had time, I'd go into the surah, open up the surah. You guys can go back and see. Now look at it from the viewpoint that this is that surah that's talking to us in this day and age. You find that Allah tests Bani Israel in two ways. Today we are seeing two fundamental tests which are coming in front of us. Specifically, as that time grows closer, you'll see that there will be two afflictions which fall this entire nation. The secret of these afflictions are found within Surah Kaf. And so the next surah comes in Surah Kaf. Within that, there are three stories, three prominent stories that come forward. All three of these stories symbolize the era of the Dajjal. And today, many of the scholars have said, we've gone into that era, we've moved into that era. Look, there's two philosophies that come forward. What is the Dajjal? Is the Dajjal a person or is the Dajjal a system? In Akhir Zaman, you'll see that there are two systems which are running parallel. These systems have been there from the very beginning of time as well. We've just labeled them in a different way. One system is known as the system of the Mahdi. One system is known as the system of Dajjal. Two of them which are running parallel. Two of them. Is it a system or a person? Look, indications when you look at comparative religions, you see that mostly every religion has an idea of a savior that's going to come in the way that we're waiting for a savior to come. Parallels of that is what sometimes shows us that all the religions are connected in some shape or form. From the beginning of time, we're seeing that they're two. Hadith talks about the idea of light and darkness, right? This movement of light, this movement of darkness. What is darkness? When you're disconnected from Hidayah, when you're disconnected from Allah's Lutf, that's what darkness is. When you look towards the light, what are you seeing? There's a movement that brings back the hearts into existence. Brings back the hearts to existence. There are two parallel systems which are running. In the time of Adam, you found these two parallel systems which were running. In the time of Nuh, you found these systems. In the time of Ibrahim, you found these systems. Musa, Isa, coming to the final era as well. But there's a difference in the final era. And that difference is narrated by the Prophet. One day, Rasulullah was sitting down. And as he sat there, he looked up and he said to one of his companions, he said that in this day and age, there is one haq and there's one batil. But then he looks up and he says, in Akhir Zaman you'll find that there'll be one haq, but there'll be multiple batils, batlan, all over the place. Everywhere that you turn, very simply you'll get deviated. What is the biggest deviation? The biggest devi deviation is when you're sitting in front of the Aymah, when you're in Karbala and Najaf, when you're sitting in a Majlis of Hussein, but you're not there, you're switched off. That is the biggest deviation. Hearts have been moved then. Look for the lies that when we come into, and you'll find that there'll be people whose hearts won't be there. There'll be people who'll be distracted by the world. There'll be people who'll be moved away by that. Imam Zaman says there's three reasons why you don't do my ziyarah. And one of them is this materialism that leads to you being distracted. What happens is that your priorities shift. The main priority is what? To bear in mind that Ahlul Bayt are here. Whoever you are, whatever you are. Important thing is this. You take care of that thing which is the most important. Your priority. Your life, the purpose of your life is not your job. The purpose of your life is that you're doing something as a follower of the Ahlul Bayt for Ahlul Bayt. That's your priority. It's important to have your priorities correct. You could be whoever you want to be. Sometimes even an Ayatollah loses himself because his priority is just his ilm. It's not ilm. Look at the hadith of the Imam and you'll see. It says there's a difference between a scholar and a person who claims to be a scholar. Three criteria. Even though he may be a mujtahid. Criteria is three. Ilm is not the milak. It's not the end goal. End goal is ma'rifah. End goal is a divine understanding. And the goal is that flower in your heart that blossoms. 
that needs to be the without which you're lost. End goal is not knowledge. Knowledge becomes a barrier. End goal is not money, it becomes a barrier. End goal is not just to be a president of a center, it becomes a barrier. End goal sometimes is not that. End goal is far loftier than that. Anything that takes you away from the Alul Bayt, regardless of what it may be, will take you to loss. In this time, in this day and age, it's important to awaken. Awaken because as many confusions as the Imam says. He talks about confusion, which will be a time of confusion. Times of confusion where we will not know the truth. Imam gives three criteria. He says that will be a time where people will be falling into materialism. And that time will be cut from the nur of the Imam. You see, when in one of the traditions it says, all of the Imam have a light. When we talk about Misbal Huda, there's a lantern, it's a light. Ayin Nur discusses this. The entire Ayin Nur is Ta'wil for Fatima the Zahra alayhi salam. The entire Ayin Nur. Allahu Nuru Samawati wal Ard. Ask, what is Allahu Nuru Samawati wal Ard? Go and look at the Ta'wil. We mentioned it a number of nights ago. From the Arsh of Allah, there's a candle. Kandil. Again, it's metaphoric language. From the Arsh of Allah, it signifies guidance. That candle or that container of light comes from the Nur of Zahra. And the light that shines is the Hidayah of Hussain ibn Ali. Quran talks about it. No human being can be guided truly until they don't understand the ma'rif of these two people. Truly. This is why, you know when you go for Arbain, right? Being with loads of little kids. You notice that every step they take, it's as if that flower is blossoming. Many times we've had conversations with many people is that we don't know why we're here for, what's the purpose? But every step they take towards Sayyidul Shahada, it's as if there's something enlightening, something moving. Words may not impact people, hearts impact people. That's why the Imam says, لَيْسَ لِعَلْمُ بِكَفْرَةِ تَعَلُّمْ إِنَّمَا هُوَ نُورٌ يَقْذِفُهُ اللَّهُ فِي قَلْبِ مَا يَشَّعَ True knowledge is what? It's not just, it doesn't come from words. It's not a book. It's the movement of the heart. If your heart is closed, what happens? You could be whoever you want to be. You don't find that there's guidance there. Guidance comes from what? Movement of the heart. Awaken your heart. This is why in Akhir Zaman, there are two parallel systems which are running. And those parallel systems, there's a system of confusion where the Prophet says there will be many butlan. The Shia community will be broken into many factions and pieces. Abu Sufyan, as long as he was a kafir, you understood. There was no threat there. The biggest threat for the Shia community in Akhir Zaman is the Shia community itself. It's not from the outside. It's from the inside and the corrosion inside that will take place. Your enemies will never overcome you. Hadith is there as long as you're united. The day that you break as a community, which we're seeing today, is the day where you'll be destroyed. Look at, look at it and see. There are seven adhab. Allah talks about, Rasulullah mentions. There are seven that bring bala on the people straight away. Adhab on the people straight away. What is the biggest adhab? When the peace of your heart goes. Torment doesn't mean that thunderbolts come from the sky. The biggest torment is that when your heart is not at peace. And looking around our communities, you don't see people at peace anymore. People are walking around, they're depressed. They've got issues, they've got problems, family issues, so forth. People are not at peace. You know, you go back 40, 50 years ago, look at your parents, they didn't have much money, right? But the one thing was there was peace. And there was peace in the families. Today, all of your wealth, all of your fame, all of your fortune, but where has it taken you? There's no peace left with people. There's no peace in our households. Only you know best. But you know, look at your household and see the peace of the house is gone, right? Avabul, seven torments. Hadith says, in Akhir zaman which will afflict the people. Specifically when the people move away from that reality. What is one of them which is dividing our communities? Hadith says, your enemies will overcome you if you move away from that which Allah has decreed, teachings of God. Today, what are we looking at? Our God has become our ego. That's what's... That's what we're looking at. We're looking at ourselves. Again, the hadith says, there's a difference between zaman e awwal and zaman e akhir. Again, it breaks the hadith down. It says, in the previous times, people would sin, but they never justified it. Today, we sin and we make it halal, and then after that, we justify it. Again, all of those are confusing. Right? There's confusing lines which are blurring. It's blurring in a way that truth and falsehood has become such. We don't know what it is. We don't know what truth is. We don't know what falsehood is. Everything is blurred now. And the biggest confusion sometimes comes from the top. This is why the hadith of the ulama are there. 
It doesn't say every scholar is going to be a scholar that's going to take you towards guidance. There are ulama that take you towards su, aimma who take you towards su, take you towards destruction. And then there's the alim al rabbani that the hadith talks about. That alim, that if you don't meet him for once every four, the hadith says 40 days, your heart begins to die. Look, those people who moved away from centers and moved away from alim al rabbani, not every alim is rabbani, but then we find ulama rabbani yun who revived the hearts. Those people who moved away from them, you've noticed slowly your heart begins to die. And the way that it dies, you don't even realize. All of a sudden, one day you may wake up and realize, 10 years ago I was something else, today I'm something else. Rahmah of Allah was upon me, I used to pray. You know, that's why they say that whatever sin that you commit, God forbid, never stop praying. Prayer is rahmat of Allah. When Allah removes his rahmah of a person, you know how he removes it? Slowly, surely takes away prayer, tawfiq of prayer, fajr, lahar, becomes, starts becoming qabar. The hajjid is taken away from you. And what happens? Slowly you're moving away, you're moving away from guidance. So this day and age is important to come back to the path of Ahlul, to open your eyes. But look, we've mentioned all of these things in the previous nights. I want to conclude, take you to a particular location. The same corruption that you find in Zaman Awwal, you find personified in these last times. But the story doesn't start here. The story starts at the very beginning. The story starts with Adam. It's a movement of Adam that takes place. You see, when Allah created all of creation, the final thing that He creates is Adam. The purpose of Adam, that Adam was going to be that locus that was to reflect all of the names and attributes of Allah. Allah created the whole world on His names. Everything in creation are but names of Allah, scattered. But Allah, Tawheed, right? Loves Tawheed. Talks to get, takes together all of the names, creates Adam. You have this locus called Adam, and when we talk about Adam, his humanity. It's the perfect man. The purpose of this perfect man, to reflect all of the names of Allah to complete creation. Adam is the polish on the mirror, that when Allah looks at the mirror, he sees his reflection. Adam, Adam is created. So when Adam is created, Afterwards, what does Allah say? He says, When I blow my soul into it, min rohi, from my soul, then all of you bow down. Hadith says this Allah blew his soul into Adam. What was that soul that Allah was blowing? Adam himself has no reality in and of itself. It's the blowing that has a reality. Ulama says that which was blown was the haqiqat in Muhammadiyah. The light of the Prophet, which consists of all of creation. Haqiqat al Muhammad. When that haqiqah was blown, then, because remember what happened, that haqiqah when it goes into Adam is dormant. For that haqiqah to alive, become alive requires the names. What were the names? The entire universe are based on the names. That person who has the power of the names has the power of the universe. Believe me, there are ulama, there are people, laymen today, who have got a fraction of the names. Isma'adham, and we've looked at it, power that Isma'adham has. You know, I remember one of my teachers, right, in Qum. He had a teacher by the name of Hafiz Iyan. Some of you have heard of Nukhudaki Isfahani. Ayatollah Nukhudaki, some of you will know because you're from Mashhad, you've seen him. He was a recluse, he didn't really come out much. But Ayatollah Nukhudaki was that person, every amal of his is Mujarrab. You know, every amal that I've done of his, whenever you've needed to be, he comes like this, comes true like that. Ayatollah Nukhudaki had a student called Hafiz Yan, Abul Hassan ah Hafiz Yan, who died in 93. Abul ha Hassan Hafiz Yan was a recluse, specifically him as well. He wasn't a politician. For most of his life, he spent in seclusion. Ayatollah Abul Hassan Hafiz Yan was one of those people who had done many riyadhas. So he used to say, had it not been for the respect of the eighth imam, whoever knocks on my door without opening it, I would have given it. Now, you may have not seen the time of Hafiz Ziyan, but believe me, if you had seen him, you would have seen what kind of a person he was. <coughs> Hafiz Ziyan had knowledge of the names, Kalimat, not all of them, but some of them. They say that he used to do Riyadh in India. He had an attachment with India. He'd go to the Himalayas, he'd do a lot of Riyadh over there. He had a friend in Kuwait. He'd stay in Kuwait for some time, and then he would go to India. It says that when he got to the Himalaya mountains, he would st stay there for 40 days. He would do what is known as riyadha, spiritual exercises. He says that one day when he was walking with one of his companions, it's in the 80s now, he spent a lot of time out of Iran, didn't spend in Iran. 
As he was walking, one day what happened was that he saw that there was a sadhu sitting there. And the sadhu would look at a sheep going past or an animal going past, he'd look at it, he'd kill it. So half of the arm began to smile. Half of the arm looked at him and he said, look, can you raise it up from the dead? He says, no, I can kill it. He goes, what? why don't you do it to me? Show me if you can do it. He said, look, if I do it to you, you'll die. He says, no, just do it, you know, no liability on you. Let's see what you can do. He draws a circle on the ground and says, sit in the circle. Half of the arm goes and sits in the circle. He says, now do it. This guy tries to do it. He's doing whatever he was doing. And then afterwards he says, look, one of the students says, your power is gone. It seems like you can't kill him. He says, it's not that. He's reciting something in his heart that's blocking it all of this. So he looks up at half of the arm. He says to half of the arm, what are you doing that's deflecting this? He says, look, I'll tell you the secret later. I want to ask you, can you raise the sheep up? He says, no. He says, let me raise it up for you and show you. He comes up to us and says, He doesn't stop there though. He says, look, I want to show you something else. Honestly, if you saw half his yarn with your own eyes, there's certain things you saw that person, you truly understand. These are the servants of the servants of the Imam. Imagine what the Imam is like. Half his yarn takes us Abba. Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasani, the Marja and Qum, narrates this. He knew Hafiz Yan very well. He says, Hafiz Yan grabs his Abba, water is flowing from it, grabs it and he chucks it at the water. And he says something strange. He says, I, the slave of Ali ibn Abi Talib, commands the Mawakkil of the water to stop. He says, the Abba stopped on the water. He goes and he sits on it. He says, Sadhu, now do you understand? He looks up, he says, I'm scared to come on. But you're always the right way. He says, what is it that you have that you can do this? He replies one thing. He says, because this head has touched the floor of the zari of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look, I'm not here to give you rhetoric and just to talk like that. Everything that I'm saying is for a reason. Maqam is achieved only through the door of the Ahlul Bayt. You can go and knock onto any door. You won't find that the full Maqam is achieved. Maqam is achieved on the door of the Ahlul Bayt. These are people in this last century that's gone. They're not people living four, five hundred years ago. They're people within the century. People of that ability. Maqam is achieved through Ahlul Bayt, through the names. The names need to behold inside of yourself. This is why when Adam repents, what does Allah say? Allah completed the names within Adam. Allah completes the names of Ibrahim. Go and look at the Quran, you'll see. Quran talks about completion and talks about the completion of the names. Before Allah gives Imamah to who? <coughs> Ibrahim, what does he say? Talks about the completion of the names of Ibrahim. What are these names? Now look, Ibrahim, Adam. Adam is told what? When I blow, when I fuck the feeling of Ruhi. All of you go into prostration. Why? Hafiqat al Muhammad was being blown. They say all of the angels prostrate, bar one stays up. Here there is a hadith of the Imam. Hadith of the Imam goes like this Had Iblis understood the reality of what Allah was blowing, he would never have opposed Allah. Reality of the Ahlul Bayt. He didn't know, he was ignorant. He was ignorant. His ignorance was based on his arrogance. Ignorance was based on his arrogance. First thing that destroys man is arrogance. Regardless of what man is, the more arrogant a man is, the more you see that the fall comes very hard. And I look at myself first. Everybody needs to retrospect. Go inside and see. First thing, arrogance. So what happens next then? And it's phenomenal. Allah gives him a respite. He says, fine, Adam and Hawa. Hawa is created. Both of them go into the garden. Now look, according to our scholars, that wasn't a heavenly garden. It was an Alam al-Barzakh. This garden was a garden which wasn't eternal gardens. This was a garden which was found in Barzakh. What was the location? The location was Kufa. This is why they say the first worship on earth was in Masjid al-Kufa. When you go into Masjid al-Kufa, you see a maqam of Jibrail, and at the same time you see the maqam of Adam, where he repented. So the entire vicinity of that we talked about Malakut, there's various realms, right? You have Alam and Mulk, which is this one. Alam and Malakut, Jabarut, Lahut, Hahut, 
these realms, multiple realms which are there, which we have to go through. This is why when Amir al-Mu'mineen stood in the Mahrabi would cry, Ah, man qillat al-zaad wa ba'd al-safar wa wa'ashat al-tariq. Amir al-Mu'mineen would talk about the fact that, look, there's a distance to go. This time is short, but there are very many realms that you have to cross. This is why it's scary, because there are realms that we have to cross. Adam wasn't in the heavenly realm, he was in Alam and Malakut, that most of you can attain living in this world if only your eyes of the heart opened up. So in this way, they say that Adam and Hawa were there. Now Adam and Hawa looked at each other. One day Hawa looks towards Adam and she says, how great a creation are we, that there's no one greater than us. Allah didn't like this. Allah didn't like this. Allah says to Adam, Adam walk. Walk and see what you see. In the hadith, Allama Majlis in the says he begins to walk and as he walks he sees a dome of ruby now this is metaphoric language this is not abs this is not the kind of language that is literal something for us to understand there's a dome of ruby there the dome of ruby had no pillars it was suspended and as it was suspended adam sees in a mukashifa a vision both of them see in a vision they see that there's a woman standing there and she has a crown on her head and this crown is illuminating she has earrings in her ears and she has a choker around her neck. Allama Mustambit narrates this in Al-Qatara. Says that she has this choker. He looks up and he looks at the beauty of this woman who's standing there. He says, Ya Allah, what's this woman that's... Look at the beauty of this woman. Allah replies. Says that, Adam, this is not from your nasl. This woman is special. She will come from the Prophet of Akhir zaman but her nur will be taken from Bayt al-Ma'mur. Her light is from Bayt al-Ma'mur, not from this light. It says, Allah told me, who is that? It says that these earrings are the manifestation of two sons of hers. And the crown is her husband. Or a crown is the prophet of God. The choker is her husband. At that moment, the hadith says, both of them prostrate. As they go to his prostration, Allah says, this is not the place of prostration. Get up. It says, why? He says, because this place is the prostration for those people who this light has been created for. It's not for you. Move away from here. But Adam understands something. There's a tree over there. Don't eat from that tree. Why? Because it's known as what? Shazrat al-Ilm. That shajra is the shajra of knowledge. The same concept you have within Kabbalah as well. So it's not something which is just found in Islam. Go and look at all of the mysticism of within Kabbalah. has this entire idea of ilm and life. Two trees that they have. Same thing is found within the mysticism of Ahlul Bayt as well. Or mysticism within Islam. It talks about the tree of knowledge. It says, don't go towards the tree of knowledge. Why Allah? Because this knowledge is not for you. You are not harming of this knowledge. You won't be able to take it. It will destroy you. That tells us not every knowledge is for everyone. Even a little Mu'mineen, when he gave knowledge, he made sure that that person, what he's for that knowledge, will give that knowledge. Knowledge is not for everyone. This is why you have in a hadith, Allah Majlis narrates. He says, one day a person comes to the sixth Imam and they say to him, Mala, show us your reality. He says, look, you won't be able to take our reality. It's not for you. You just carry on what you're doing. He says, no, Mala, I want to see your reality. He says, okay, you're insisting, come inside. Hadith says, Imam takes him into a room, closes the door. He puts one hand on the ground and it says the ground is pissed. Every object, it's like they were in a vortex. A person gets scared, he says, Mala, take me back takes him back. He says, look, you don't understand our reality. To understand the reality means that you have to be something far greater. So in this way, Allah says to Adam, He says, look, don't eat from it. If you eat from it, it's not for you. Now the hadith says the tree, some narrations say it was a wheat tree. Some say it was a date tree. Some say it was an apple tree. The fact is that it was a tree with many fruits on it. That's what tells us it's not a heavenly tree. It was a worldly tree. And so Allah says, don't eat from it. What happens? Hadith says, within the garden, a snake comes. Right? It is in front of you. There's a conclusion I want to reach. This is why I'm telling you the story. Snake comes. In those days, snake was the protector of heaven. At that stage, Adam had not understood what treachery is. Didn't really realize. He hadn't been completed. This is why Samani, the great Persian mystic, says, he says, the purpose of the decline of Adam onto this earth wasn't because of the fact that he had committed a sin, but because Allah wanted to complete him and show him his what? Weaknesses. Why do we go through trial and tribulation for? Because it's not the fact that Allah hates you. It's because Allah wants to expose you to your weaknesses so that you may become perfected. That's the reason, right? So you understand your weaknesses. Why is that? Why has Allah sent us to this world? He could have kept us in heaven. No, because for completion to take place,
for all of the names to manifest in the heart of man requires man to become grateful. Man does not become grateful until Allah doesn't test him. Let me go back to the hadith of the sixth imam. Had it not been for three things, man would have been arrogant. Firstly, death. The reality of death teaches us what? Gratitude. Humbles us. Second thing, illnesses. Third thing, poverty. Poverty destroys us. Illness destroys It makes you realize I'm not the greatest thing since sliced bread. It makes you humble. When trial and tribulation befalls you, I've seen people who used to walk with their chest out. The day they lost their money and were bankrupt, you find that they sit at the back now and they leave. Where's the arrogance gone? In this life you'll see that. Where's the arrogance gone? Don't be possessed, right? Don't be possessed by these material things. Complete yourself. Allah tested Adam. So here the tradition now says, says the snake comes towards Adam and his sister Adam. Iblis was inside. His sister Adam, Adam, why don't you go and eat from the tree? He says, because Allah's forbidden. He says, Adam, don't you realize? That tree is the tree of Ma'rifah. If you were to eat from that tree, it would give you divine knowledge. Shaitan, his methodology, look at it, give you divine knowledge. And then he stops and he says, he says, and it will give you the ability to live forever. And so at the moment, Adam sits down and he says, but look, Allah said not to eat from that. He says, no, you don't realize Allah is giving you permission. And then he turns around and he says, but Allah is holding you back from this knowledge. Adam turns around and he says, your shaitan, leave me. These are the qualities of shaitan, to disobey the creator. Sometimes in our life, we see an opportunity that comes and we don't realize that that opportunity will deviate us. You see it sparkling in front of you in the way that Umar ibn Sa'd, that person who was with what? Was what with Amir al-Mu'mini in the Battle of Safin. Shown riches, he deviates. We only live once, right? Maybe Allah will forgive us later on. Deviation moves away. What does Adam say? He says, you're shaitan. Shaitan comes with two things to deviate us. Knowledge, dominion over people, life. I see that with everyone. He goes to Hawa. When he goes to Hawa, he changes his technique now. Enemy never comes to the same person with the same technique. Technique differs. At this moment, he looks towards Hawa and he says something to her. He says that Allah has allowed you to eat from the tree, so go and eat from it. So she looks up and she says, what well, are you sure about that? Then he replies, he says that, look, if you eat from the tree, you will gain domination over Adam. She says, are you sure? He says, yes. You sure Allah has allowed it? Yes. He goes towards the tree. Ulema have said that there are three ways of shaitan where he overcomes us. When he wants to corrupt a person, what does he do? Shaitan wants to corrupt you. He either gives you this ability that maybe you'll dominate over somebody else. This is why human beings go towards what? Kursi, as the hadith says. They go towards position. They want position because they want to dominate over people. They want respect over people. They want to be seen as something else. Second thing, if a person is a pious person, Shaitan will come to him to say that there's divine knowledge. You'll understand something another person doesn't do. Exclusivity. You want to feel special. These are the methodologies that Shaitan uses. Here he says to Hawa, go. Hawa begins to go towards the tree. As she begins to go to where Allah commands the angels, he says, look, go stand to one side, let her go. He says, but why Allah? He says, because I want her to realize her weakness. In the hadith, it says, sometimes Allah allows us to sin. The purpose of that is so that you can understand your weak. Had you not understood your weakness, you would never be able to reach the maqam that you should reach. Not saying that go and sin. I dare sometimes Allah does that. This is why the fourth Imam in Dua Makaram al Akhlaq says time and time again, you pray for stuff even though Allah said, ask and I'll give you. Allah does not give you that because He knows had He given it to you, it would have been corrupted. This is why whenever you pray to Allah for something, ask Him to remove the negativity that comes with it. Allah give me status, but remove the arrogance that comes with status. Allah gives me, for example, wealth, but remove that arrogance that comes with wealth. Imam teaches us and only the Imam can teach you how to pray like that. Look, recite the salawat and come forward as people stand up and back.
Bobo starts going towards the tree. As she goes to the tree, she picks up the fruit and she eats it. She sees nothing has happened to me. She comes back to Adam. She says, Adam, Allah has removed the command. Eat from it. Adam was simple. Adam says, are you sure? He says, yes. Start walking to the tree and you'll see the angels won't touch you. Says so Adam begins to walk to the tree. Allah commands the angels. He says, no, leave Adam. Let him go. What does Allah want to show him? His weaknesses. Begins to go. Comes close to the tree. Takes the fruit from the tree. Quran says, what does Allah do? Allah shows Adam his nakedness. What is his nakedness? His vices. Everything comes forward to symbolize to Adam, this is what you are. Adam begins to cry. Tanqaula, right? I don't have time to go into the entire tradition of this. Adam is sent on the world. They say when Adam is sent to the world, he begins to cry. He cries a lot. Baqa, Shadid, Hadith, continues to cry. Why? Separation from Allah. Separation from that maqam. Begins to cry. Allah then tests him. Right? So here, you find that shaitan comes with three things. Allah tests him now. The biggest test that Allah gives him is the test of children. Hadith says that Adam had a daughter before Habil and Qabil. Habil and Qabil before that. Inaq, the daughter's name was. She transgressed. Allah tested, he destroyed her. But we don't have time to go into how she transgressed, what happened, what didn't happen. But the idea is that you find that the biggest test for anyone, specifically when, they're, when they have a family, is their children. You see that with Zubair, where Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Zubair was one of us. What happened? He was fighting with Amir al-Mu'mineen. You notice that when Amir al-Mu'mineen was dragged by the neck, he took his sword out. Hadith says, Amir al-Mu'mineen says to Zubair, Zubair, put your head down your sword. This is Medina, put down your sword. He puts his sword down. Here's a man who's with Amir al-Mu'mineen. How is he tested? With his children. Great people have been misguided just because of their children. Now we could list a lot of people. Here Adam is tested. Adam is tested with his children. And here Adam cries and he becomes quiet. Incident of Habil and Qabil takes place. When the incident takes place, Allah says to Adam, He says, Adam, your life is coming to an end. Give the names to your son. Give the names. The older brother listened. He came and says, Father, I'm older though. Why are you giving the names to him for? He says, listen, son, the names come from Allah. Succession comes from Allah. Does it come from me? <laughs> Succession comes from Allah. It doesn't come from me. I don't have the right to make my son a Khalifa. Succession comes from Allah. And this is the Sunnah of the Prophets, right? Sunnah of the Prophets. As Abrahamic faiths, were the Jews or Christians, Succession is from Allah. What happens? The entire tests happen. One son kills the other son. Ibrahim, sorry, Adam, sits back and he again begins to cry. Curses the ground. Curses the ground until Allah, 40 days later, tells him the haqqaiq of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Haqiqa, this is not just a battle, it's the haqqaiq of Sayyid al-Shuhada. It stops. It says, from that day onwards, Adam remains quiet, doesn't talk. Days go by. Ayatollah Bahjid now narrates this. He says that his children come to him, grandchildren, say, Father, Abu Bashir, why don't you talk for you've gone quiet? You've gone quiet. You know, the last couple of nights we were talking about different forms of spiritual development. Here's one of them. He says, Father, why have you become quiet for Abu Bashir? Abu Bashir replies, Ayatollah Bahjid narrated this. He says that Adam looks up towards his children and he says, The day Allah brought me to this physical world, Jibrail said, If you ever want to reach your maqam again, close your mouth, shut your tongue, and you'll see Allah will elevate you again. Why? 180 sins, according to ulama, come from the tongue. What corrupts you and takes you to kufr is the tongue. And today you see that none of us have control over it. Now our tongue is converted onto social media and we're bashing one another. We're insulting one another. The unity of the Shias is compromised. You know, we fight in front of people who are not from us. And it's embarrassing that we're in this situation. Everything goes back to the tongue. It manifests, right? Tongue is manifested. When Allah talks about the tongue, He talks about communication sometimes. Sometimes the best thing is that we become quiet. 
So there's a lot to talk about. Possibly we'll discuss the rest tomorrow. It's been a long journey that's taken place in the last seven, eight days. We've looked at a lot of things. But from the minute that I walked in here, for whatever reason, you know, heart was breaking today. And the reason being is this. A lot of you are not here for the vibe today. A lot of you here are for the Messiah. You know why? Because a lot of you have Aqeedah to Abbas. A lot of you have Aqeedah to Abbas. Your mothers, when you were smaller, used to tell you, Son, whenever you have a problem, just go to the flag of Abbas, hold on to the flag and you'll see that Allah fulfills your du'a. I want to narrate a story that I narrated just before I came here and then we'll go into the Messiah. Just to make you understand who Abbas is. We won't have time at the end now to do du'a. We won't. Having seen you for the last couple of days, I don't think you'll ever be able to take the Messiah of Abbas. So we won't have time for du'a. But I'm going to give you just one story that I narrated before. The story went like this. It goes like this. In 2007, one of my cousins was telling me in the city of Lucknow. He says, I saw it with my eyes physically. He says that there was on the day, on the eighth day, when the flag of Abbas comes out, 2007, he says that the day when the flag of Abbas comes out, there are about 30,000 Hindus who come. And they know, and they've been told, that when all of the doors close, come to the door of Abbas and you'll see that whatever you want, Allah will give you. Says that this Hindu Rajput, Rajput comes with his wife, and he goes under the flag of Abbas. Now this isn't a believer, this is not a Shia, right? But no, Abbas is Lutfus for all of mankind. Why do we reserve it just for ourselves? Ahlul Bayt give to everyone. Says that this Rajput comes, he holds on to the flag of Abbas. He says, Abu Fadwil Abbas, my mother has told me that in times of crisis I should come to your flag. I don't have any children, it's been 10 years. Allah hasn't given me any children. I've gone to everyone. I've gone from Ilaba to the Kumba Mela, I've gone everywhere. Now I'm coming here to ask you because my mother has said to me that whenever you have an issue, hold on to the flag of Abbas and us. I've come here to say to you, Abbas, give me a son. Abbas, give me a son. For the sake of Sayyid al-Shahada's four-year-old girl. For the sake of Sayyid al-Shahada's four-year-old girl. Imam al-Zaman once said to someone, Imam al-Zaman said, he said, if you ever want your du'a to be answered, this person said, said Imam al-Zaman said, he said, ask from three wasthas, ask three. He says, ask Abbas from three wasilas, and you'll see that Abbas will answer. So they said, Mala, tell us, what is the first wasila? He says, the first wasila is Hussein's daughter. The first wasila is Hussein's daughter. May Ummul Banin bless you. My heart tells me today, this is the one of the only days where you find Sayyid al-Shahada himself comes here. Hussein loved his brother a lot. Hussein comes here. The Zahara comes. Give your condolences today to Umar Abayn. And when those tears come into your eyes, all of those people who have said Iltimas Adha, today ask. Take yourself today, for one second, remove all of the pain in your heart. Forget your life, forget your wife, everything, husband, everything, forget today. Just for five minutes, just close your eyes. And imagine you're sitting in Baqi. Next to Baqi, there's a grave. And that grave is broken. Go to that grave. Say, Ummul Banin. Your son Abbas was very brave on the day of Ashura. Do you know why you should say that? Say, your son was very brave. There's a hadith why you should say that. Hadith goes like this. It says that when Bashir comes in and he says, and he says, It says, Ummul Banin stands up. She says, Father, bring me my stick. She grabs onto the stick. 
she looks towards Najaf. She says, Amir al forgive me, that my Abbas wasn't able to save you, Hussein. Old Mumbal Banin so stands up. She comes out, she goes towards Masjid al Nabawi. She says, Bashir, tell me, which Hussein do you talk about? Says Zahra son Hussein. Says, says, I can't believe it. It says, why? It says, because my Abbas was with Hussein. It says, but your Abbas was killed. It says, I can't believe that my Abbas was killed. Tell me, how was Abbas killed? It says, they came from the back and they hit him on the back of the head. She says, now I definitely don't believe you. It says, why? It says, because no mother has born a son like mine. I know Abbas can protect himself on the back and the front. It says, no, but Ummul Benin, when they hit Abbas on the back, his arms went down. She says, what happened to his arms? It says, they cut his right arm and they cut his left arm. It says, so tell me one thing then. It says, what is it? it says, what? It says, Ummul Benin stands up. She falls to the ground. Asa comes out of her hand. She falls. But she looks up. It says, that I'm berated. That Abbas fell. It says, Ummul Benin, why are you fall to the ground for? for the sake of Sakina. <laughs> and then after that, if you think that your dua may not be answered, then ask for the sake of Zainab's child. <laughs> and if there's a big problem that befalls your life, very big problem, then say Abbas for the sake of your mother Ummul Bani. Let it not be today that anyone walks out of here without their dua not being answered. Everyone knows something. Today you come to Abbas alayhi salam. The Raj book now says, he says, I held on to the flag of Abu Fadl Abbas and I said, for the sake of Sakina, give me a son, give me a son. And then for some reason he got very emotional. He's a Raj book. He says, Abbas, if you give me a son, I'll bury my son in your way. Mother looks up and she says, she says, why are you saying this for? We haven't had children for 10 years. They say, said, look, forget it. Both of them come home. That night they sleep. Says days go by. Says that she becomes pregnant. Nine months later, she gives birth to a child. But he said, the Rajput says, I go, I take this child in my hands. I look at this child, something comes into my mind. When I look at the child with love, I remember Hussein holding Ali Asghar in his hand, and then I remember the promise that I've made. I remember the promise that I've made to Abbas. I grabbed that child hard. My heart was breaking. I took that child. I go outside of Lucknow. When I go there, I begin to dig. As I dig there, I put the child in. When I put the child in, I see the child smiling at me. The child is smiling. The child is moving. I think to myself, how am I going to do this? But I've made a promise, and I'm a Rajput. And Rajputs keep their promise. I took the dirt. I put the dirt on that child. I begin to walk. When I get to my door, I begin to walk from the road to the door. The road to the door. Because I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to go inside? A mother is sitting inside. Even though I've made that promise, what am I going to do? He opens the door. He comes inside. The mother is sitting there with the child. He looks towards the child. He becomes angry. Didn't I tell you not to follow me? Didn't I tell you not to follow me? Mother says something. She says, 
half an hour after you went, there was a knock on the door. When I opened the door, a very tall man was standing there. As that tall man was standing there, he says, take the baby and tell your husband, whatever we Al Bay give, we don't take back again. Take this. Whatever we Al Bay give, we don't take back. People, you've come now to cry for a father of us. May it not be that anyone leaves there without taking back. What is a boss? A boss is that person that Hadith says that your Mola Amir al after every prayer, only pray for one thing. Imagine your Imam who has everything and all of this universe used to raise his hands after Fajr prayer and say, Allah, give me a son a boss so that he protects my Hussein on the day of Ashura. So that he protects my Hussein on the day of Ashura. You know what the tradition says? The tradition said this. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen walks home. And as he opens the door, walks into the sand, he sees his two daughters are walking to Umna Gulfoon and Zainab. And they're holding the hand of Abbas and teaching Abbas how to walk. Abbas is only two years old. As he looks, he smiles. He says, what a day has come that my daughters are teaching my son how to walk. How to walk. The tradition says, Zainab looks towards Amir al she says, no father, today we are learning to walk in the shadow of a bus because we know who a bus is. Today we're learning to walk in the shadow of a bus. Amir al muminin loved a bus a lot. A bus was his dua. You know what a bus means to Amir al muminin You know why he means so much to Amir al muminin You know why he means so much to Amir al muminin 11 AH is the year. Amir al muminin comes to the lifeless body of his wife, puts her head on his lap, Zahra opens her eyes. Zahra's 18 years were Masaib. When she was born, everybody left her mother. She was alone. At the age of five, her mother became Yatim. At the age of 18, her rib was broken. Her eye was bruised. Five children she had, all five of them she knew what their Masai was going to be. Zahra only had one happiness in his her life. It says when Amir al held her head, you know what she tricks her? She says to Amir al she says, Abul Hassan, do you remember that I'm paraphrasing? Abul Hassan, do you remember the most happiest moment of my life when I was to be married to you? She only had one happiness. That was when she was married to Amir al She says that when Jibreel came down and Jibreel says, Zahra, what is going to be your nahar? When Jibreel says, Allah is giving you the whole world. I didn't say anything. Do you remember? I remained quiet. Jibreel goes up, comes back again, says, I've given you the oceans. Again, she remained quiet. I've given you the world. Again, she remained quiet. Allah says to Jibreel, ask Zahra what she wants. <laughs> you know Zahra replied? She says, I only want one thing. Zahra, what is that? She says, I want to intercede for all of those people on the day of judgment who cry over my Hussein. That's all I want. At that moment then she says, Abdul Hassan, I'm leaving this world, but I want you to do me one favor. Says, what is that? She says, when my son Abbas comes into this world, give my salams to Abbas. Zahra prayed for Abbas. I don't know how you heard that. Ten years of little moment, he doesn't have a child. Take a breath. You can't cry like Imam Hussein al Abidin can cry. I'm going to narrate now the Masai of Abbas slowly. So far, I haven't narrated the Masai of Abbas. I've been talking about the Fadail you've been crying like this. Sometimes a person's life is such that Fadail is Masai as well. Fadail is Masai as well. They say that when Ummul Banin married Amir al muminin all of Banu Hashim took out their swords. All of the Ummul Banin walked under the swords. As she got to the house of Amir al muminin she sits on the door, she doesn't go inside. Zainab come, they grab one arm, Ummul Banin grabs one arm. 
They say, Mother, why don't you go inside for? With tears in her eyes, she says, How can I go into the house where Fatima the Zahra spent nine years of my life there? I can't go into this house. She says, No, come inside, we'll take you inside. She comes inside of the house. She comes as a slave of the house of Ahlul Bayt. Ten years go by. Ten years go by. Tenth year, ten years go. Tenth year, Ummul Banin has a child. A child is a bus. Ummul Banin wraps a bus in a white piece of cloth. Now within Ahlul Bayt, whenever Amir al Mu'minin had a son, he would go and kiss the child on the forehead. They say this time when he walks in, he lifts his Abbas up, he opens the sheets, he kisses his right arm, and he kisses his left arm. Umul Benin begins to cry. She begins to cry. Amir al-Mu'amid, he says, Umul Benin, why do you cry for? Why do you cry for? She says, I've seen you, my mullah, that when a child is born, you kiss the head. Is it because my son is the son of a slave that you kiss the right arm and he kissed the left arm? Says, no, Umul Benin, you are born. Mu'minin was of Abbas. Do you know how proud he was? Hadith says the Battle of Safin comes. Hadith says, look at the writing. Hadith says, an old father stands there watching his young son go into the battlefield. He says to all of the people, look, my son is going into the battlefield. My son is going into the battlefield. That son says to Malik al today I'm going to show the world how the sword of Ali works, how his son is like, as it begins to fight in the battlefield. Amir al begins to become proud. He says, look at my son as he begins to attack. It's Amir al He's proud of his son. Fadail of Amir al-Mu'mini, Fadail of Abbas of crime, not the Messiah. I'm thinking, how am I going to recite the Messiah of Abbas? Hajjad. Raise your hands. Give your condolences. I won't be able to recite all of it. Nor can my heart take it. But I'll say one thing though. Sayyid Mahdi Bahrul Rum. Somebody comes to Sayyid Mahdi and they say that there's water in the shrine of a bus. There's water in the shrine of a bus. It's a lot of water there. Can you come inside? And can you help me remove the water? Sayyid Mehdi Bahl al goes down. They start to remove the water. They say the man asks him a strange question. The Sayyid Mehdi removes his amama and begins to hit his head on the wall. He asks him, he says, we've heard from the traditions that Abbas was very tall, that this grave is very small. The grave is very small. Abbas was tall. The grave is very small. So what happened to Abbas? Sayyid Mehdi Bahl al begins to cry. He says one thing. He says, no, no, I wish you hadn't asked me this question. He says, why? They said, no, only in the chop the head of a bus. But on the night of Ashura, they took lead pipes and they hit the body of a bus so that the body began to, the bones were broken. Then when Imam Zayn al Abidin came, he put it up onto the ground. As he put his up onto the ground, when he put it lifted up, one rib, the other rib would collapse. As he lifted the leg, the other leg would collapse. They put all of the pieces of Oh, 
Who's all of us on the board? Bunch of time. All of us on the board. He comes back. He comes back. Take a breath. He can't cry. Continuously. Comes back. He says to Ali Akbar, Ali Akbar, let's not trouble your father. Half of the army of Yazid I'll take. A quarter you take. Ashab was saying you take the rest. Abbas was thinking Hussein was going to let him fight. Day of Ashura comes. His body comes back. Abbas goes to Mola and says, Mola, I want to fight. But you're the standard bearer of my army, Abbas. Habib's body, Muslim's body, one by one, each one of the bodies are coming. Abbas is saying, I want to fight, Mola. I want to fight, Mola. Mola is saying, but you're the standard bearer of my army. Then the Habib says, Asim's body, when it was scattered, Abbas is... So the Mullah says, Mullah, I want to fight. Ali Akbar's body came in. Mullah, I want to fight. Ali Muhammad's bodies came in. He looks up at Sayyid the shahada He says, all of the children I have trained with my own hands, their bodies are lying here. Mullah, I give me the permission to fight. And he says that, but he doesn't give him permission. In the hadith, he says, this Abbas is walking. As he comes past the tent, he sees a small girl. She walks into the tent. She takes a flask. She rubs the coldness on her lips. She puts it on her forehead. She begins to cry. She shakes the water for There's no water there. She comes out. Abbas sees his opportunity. He says, Sagina, go to your father and just ask him one thing. Let me bring water. Let me bring water. She goes to her say the Shada. She says one thing. She says, Father, I'm thirsty. Give permission to my uncle to go into the battlefield. You know what the says? Sakina comes back, she says to all of these small girls, she says, children, sit down, bring your water containers, because my uncle Abbas is going into the battlefield. In the tradition, it's not going to be all of it, but I'm going to narrate just one point. It says, Abbas gets on his horse, with the Jalal is about to ride, as he begins to ride. Hadim says this, an old brother looks up to his young brother, he says, brother, before you go, just do me one thing, just do me one thing. He says, what is that? He says, your old sister is waiting for you in the tent. Just go and seek the permission. Abbas takes his horse. He removes takes it to the tent. As he takes it to the tent of Zainab, he says, Zainab, Assalamu alaikum. He gives his salam. Oh, daughter of Zahra, I give you my final salam. He says, an old sister comes out of the tent. She says, Abbas, for one moment, can you come into my tent, please? Abbas gets off the horse. He comes inside of the tent. The hadith says, an old sister raises her arms. She puts her hands around the neck of Abbas. And she begins to kiss Abbas. And she begins to cry. She says something strange. She says, when I came into Gufa for the first time, my father said that one day your arms will be tied behind them. I knew it was true, but I thought to myself, when I have a brother like Abbas, how can my arms be tied like that? Abbas, just hold on for one second. She goes to the women. She says, women, today I can't secure your hijabs anymore because my brother Abbas is going to the battlefield. Abbas gets on the horse. As he gets on the horse, he begins to ride. As he begins to ride, the children begin to watch. Sakina sitting at the front. All of the children are around her. She says, just wait. My uncle Abbas is about to come. My uncle Abbas is about to come. All your mouth debated. What did Imam Hussein say to Abbas? What did he take away from Abbas? The Hadith says this. I six the man says Abbas had nothing on Basira. When he looked at someone, he could kill them. Hussein took away this power that when you look at someone, Abbas can't look now and kill someone. Says Abbas begins to ride. Hadith says 4,000 archers come standing in front of Abbas. When they see Abbas, they say to Umar ibn Nisad, we can't fight this person. This person is the son of Amir al Abbas writes, he killed many people. Abbas writes to the water. I can't narrate all of it. But the hadith says this now. When he goes towards the water, he looks towards the water. He says to his animal, why don't you drink from the water? Animal doesn't drink. Abbas looks with uh, up at the water. As he looks at the water, fills the water. As he fills the water, gets on his horse. As he gets on his horse, now he begins to ride. Now you know what the hadith says. It says this. I can't narrate everything. It says this. Sakina now looks up as she sees her. As she sees her. She sees the flag of Abbas. It begins to go in one direction. As it begins to go, she chucks the water flask on the floor. She says, oh, you children, chuck the floor. Raise your hands. Sakina, small hands. She lifts 
just take this water back to the time of Sagina's thirsty, Sagina's thirsty. We don't want to reply comes, the reply comes, of course we haven't accepted your dua. We haven't accepted your dua. But because of this one dua, we've made you Baba Hawaii. Between 